Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Yes, I covered chapter 7 already a couple of weeks ago, so I'm just going to move on to chapter 10. And I'm going to ask Steve to open up in prayer. So, Steve, would you pray, please? Dear Father, thank you for gathering us today, Father, to learn more about your word, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Lord Jesus, you are our treasure. You are the manna on which we feed on, Father. Thank you for your word. Your word would equip us, Father. Your word will edify us, will strengthen us. I pray that you bless everyone that will listen to your word today and everyone that will participate today, Father. And I pray, Father, that you bless uh, Pastor Alex that will be giving this teaching today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. So we're going to start off with a reading of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Here we go. As dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little <laughs> foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. A wise person chooses the right road. A fool takes the wrong one. You can identify fools just by the way they walk down the street. If your boss is angry at you, don't quit. A quiet spirit can overcome even great mistakes. There is another evil I have seen under the sun. Kings and rulers make a grave mistake when they give great authority to foolish people and low positions to people of proven worth. I have even seen servants riding horseback like princes and princes walking like servants. When you dig a well, you might fall in. When you demolish an old wall, you could be bitten by a snake. When you work in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there is danger. Well, What's the difference between cinnamon and metformin? Just a moment. They both great for reducing blood sugar, but one is now danger with each stroke of your ax. Using a dull ax requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. If a snake bites before you charm it, what's the use of being a snake charmer? Wise words bring approval, but fools are destroyed by their own words. Fools base their thoughts on foolish assumptions, so their conclusions will be wicked madness. They chatter on and on. No one really knows what is going to happen. No one can predict the future. Fools are so exhausted by a little work that they can't even find their way home. What sorrow for the land ruled by a servant, the land whose leaders feast in the morning. Happy is the land whose king is a noble leader and whose leaders feast at the proper time to gain strength for their work, not to get drunk. Laziness leads to a sagging roof. Idleness leads to a leaky house. A party gives laughter, wine gives happiness, and money gives everything. Never make light of the king even in your thoughts. And don't make fun of the powerful, even in your own bedroom. For a little bird might deliver your message and tell them what you said. Thanks for watching our Okay, so let's get into it right now. We'll go to our notes. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Solomon is now closing in on God. He's beginning to repent. He's beginning to understand things. And things are becoming clear because now his original wisdom is kicking in because he realizes after all this living and all this sinning that without God, things are so hopeless that the only alternative is to serve him with all his art. And it doesn't take much to fall away. All it takes is one misstep and that's all it takes to take you down. So he starts off by saying, dead flies putrefy the, pur the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul order. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. And here's a, an artist's depiction of flies in the ointment right there. <clears throat> Which means one dead fly spoils the perfume. One act of sin can destroy a lifetime of righteousness. One foolish move can wipe out a legacy of success. One act of sin can eliminate a powerful ministry. And the examples in the Bible are endless. We have King David, who was a man after God's own heart, who sinned with Bathsheba, wiping out his entire legacy. And after that, he had nothing but trouble in his house up until the time that his son Absalom, Absalom rebelled against him and uh, caused an internal war that drove David eventually to his death. Then we have Solomon, David's son, who's foolish, 
who uh, his first uh, years as king were great because he followed God and he did everything the Lord wanted him to do. But eventually he turned away because he started marrying foreign women and the foreign women turned him away from his God. Then we have Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to it. <clears throat> My throat is really <clears throat> not in good shape. Wow. Moses struck the rock at the end of his life when God told him to speak to it. He had struck the rock, the rock earlier in his ministry. But then uh, when the children of Israel were uh, asking for water, God told him to speak to the rock instead of striking it because striking the rock indicated the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Moses struck the rock in anger, it would indicate that Jesus would have to be crucified again for the sins of the world. So all he had to do was speak to the rock because the rock had already been struck the first time. Then there was Hezekiah who showed his riches to Babylon and eventually the Babylonian king came into Jerusalem and took everything away. That was a stupid thing to do. Judas Iscariot was another example who followed the Lord for three and a half years and was a disciple of God, but then turned to money and betrayed his Lord. And there are some modern examples too of one sin killing an entire ministry or killing a legacy. We have the PTL scandal. PTL was a TV program years ago. It was one of the best Christian programs I'd ever seen. It was fashioned after the Johnny Carson show. The hosts of the program were Jim and Tammy Baker. And uh, it was a tremendous program with real ministry and miracles happening and wonderful things, testimonies being shared. It was incredible. And it launched the success of many other ministries besides. But there was marital problems between Jim and Tammy, and eventually Jim committed adultery with some secretary from Long Island and ruined the entire ministry. So one dead fly spoiled the perfume. And there are many other scandals of ministers, too many to recount here. Then we have the desecration of Ravi Zacharias which is questionable, but I'm going to just talk to you about Ravi for a second. He was the greatest apologist who ever lived. His work still bears tremendous testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the end of his life, it was found out that he was involved in some kind of sexual abuse of women. And after he died, all these women came forward to testify against him. And it kind of ruined his ministry. In fact, it destroyed his ministry. They had to shut it down and embarrassed his family. But there are some questions about whether he actually was a sexual predator or not. Then there was Richard Nixon's Watergate. Richard Nixon was one of the most effective presidents of the United States, but because of his paranoia, he taped conversations in the White House. And as a result, he covered it up when he was discovered that he was uh, <clears throat> sending people to spy on Democrats. So Richard Nixon made a mistake and brought down his presidency. He had to resign. So the gifts of God are irrevocable, and as a result, some great ministers assume that they have the favor of God, even while they're still in sin, because they're still being used to spread the gospel. But that's not true. You, you can, God can use anybody to spread the gospel, and gifts do not indicate anything. So my first question is, how should we treat people who ruin their lives by a momentary or continuous indiscretion? How should we deal with people who fall into sin? Itzhak. Turn on your microphone, Itzak. We should treat the people, those who ruin their life just due to sin. We should emphasize on the on the scriptures that what Jesus has done for you, for for them. And uh, now we are saved and we are new creation. So we leave the sin behind and we should work for the glory of God. Okay, thank you. Jamie, how should we treat people who fall into sin and then come to us for help? Don't forget to turn on your mic. I did, sorry. Um, you know, like God would. He, he's there. He's so merciful. He's so forgiving. He's so loving. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, when we come to him, he just forgives us. So I think we just need to, like... His hex, I just remind um, them of all the attributes of God and that we are the same. We're not here to judge. We're here to love and we're here to help and to guide and to encourage. And, you know, so I think we have to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. Kofi, how should we treat people who fall into sin as a church? With love. Okay, explain. Especially if they come, as you mentioned previously, if they come to us for help, we have yes. to treat them with love. Uh, Ephesians 6 talks about um, those who are strong 
um, helping and bringing and raising back those that have fallen uh, back into the into the flock. So uh, there's a there, there's a responsibility on our part to to treat them with love and disciple them back. Um, I guess you know until they are, they're back on their feet again. Okay. Well, actually, it's Galatians six. But here's what it yes, says. Sorry. I think Kofi was referring to Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each man examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself and not alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. And here's an artist's depiction of the body of Christ helping somebody out of sin. It should be something like this. We who are strong, helping the one who is weak, taking care of ourselves and watching ourselves, lest we ourselves also fall into that same pit. So that's the attitude that we should have. An attitude of love, restoration, and reconciliation. Now, as, as a minister, I can tell you that ministers are left wide open for a fall, since often... We are accountable to ourselves alone, and sometimes we're too proud to open up to others, and we can't really trust people to treat us with discretion because people like to gossip, so we like to keep our problems to ourselves, and many times ministers don't have enough prayer support, or they simply get burnt out and get sloppy. So ministers have to be especially careful and also have a, a network of people or some people around them that they can talk to and have pray for them, because a minister's life can get very lonely if he just accounts only to himself. Solomon continues in verse 2. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now, this is not a political statement, although to some it may bear some validity, but uh, Jews considered the right as a path of blessing and favor with God, uprightness, blessing, and the right hand represents the spirit. The left hand represents a curse in the scriptures, the path of ungodliness and sin, every evil thing, and it represents the flesh. So that's why Jesus sits at the right hand of God. And he told his disciples to catch fish on the right side of the boat. And also that the priests of the Old Testament were anointed on the right ear, the right hand, and the right big toe with blood, as you can see in the picture down here, anointed on the right ear. So they could hear from God, so they could act with God, and so they could walk with God. The left hand of God is never mentioned in the Bible, only his right hand is, and this is because God is spirit and right points to the spirit. So regrettably, in many cultural conditions, left-handed people are considered freaks, and many were forced to use their right hands for various tasks, such as my sister Marietta. Marietta was born right after me. She's the second oldest in our family, and she happens to be left-handed. And I remember while we were growing up, my mother would torment her to no end and just punish her for using her left hand to write, her left hand to cook, her left hand to pick up things. It was awful to see how my mother treated my sister Marietta because she was left-handed. But the left-hand curse comes from this. So I can't really blame my mother, but the thing is that left-handed people are no less cursed or no less sinful or no more sinful than anybody else. And if they find Christ, then their left hand can be used for God's glory. Solomon continues. Even when a fool walks along the way, which is the right way, the way, the truth, and the life, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool, which means that you can't fake wisdom, spirituality, and sincerity, because in time, you'll be exposed for the fraud that you are. You can't fake it for a long time. That's true. And a perfect example of that is in Acts chapter 5, when a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Spirit of God and keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own to control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. And so great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. 
And Peter answered her and said, Tell me whether you sold the land for this much. She said, Yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of God? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. So that's what happens when you try to fake spirituality. Now, there are fakes in ministry as well. False prophets, false pastors, and false teachers. So in general, how do we determine who is a false minister? Lise, I'm going to ask you that one. Lise, how do we determine who's a false minister? Verify the scriptures that they use and see if they are accurate. Sometimes okay, that's one, a, yeah. a word or two can make a huge difference. Okay, thank you. Rahad, how can we tell if someone is a false minister? Yeshua said that you will know them by their fruit. Okay. So it's very important that we are able to see the fruit. And that's also, it's very important for us to be in tune with Holy Spirit and like very rooted in the scriptures so that we can know how to, to determine like whether the fruit is good or not. Okay, so John, what would you consider fruit in the life of a minister? John, oh, uh, what would well, you consider? Uh, let me just ask the question again. What would you okay. consider fruit in the life of a minister or a ministry? What is the fruit? Uh, would be their deeds, their words yeah. and their deeds. Uh, their words the, and their the deeds. deeds, okay. The deeds are, uh, are deeds of uh, love, joy, peace, kindness, patience. Uh, these these are the fruit of the spirit. So and, you look uh, for the fruit of the spirit. People they don't they don't just talk a good game. They do what they say. Okay, they don't talk a good game. They I mean they don't just talk a good game. They do what they say. Okay, well that's good. That's one way to determine fruit. Here's an artist's depiction of a false minister. Is that cool or what? <laughs> a wolf in sheep's clothing. The Apostle Peter writes a very long passage about how to tell the difference between false ministers and real ones. So I'm going to read that to you now. Where in 2 Peter 2, he says, But there are also false prophets amongst the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Underlined are their characteristics or their fruit, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. A little farther in the chapter, in verse 12, it says, These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm that they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain amongst you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Verse 14. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. Verse 15. They have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam the son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong, but Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. Verse 17, these people are useless as dried up springs or as a mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to the blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from the lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption for you're a slave to whatever controls you. So what I did was I summarized all of these particular characteristics, which are given in poetic form. And this is basically the fruit of those who are false ministers. They love money. They teach heresies. In other words, they twist and amend the word of God. They flatter you with false prophecies. Boy, oh boy, people have made an industry of giving people prophecies that don't apply to them at all. All they do is flatter them and make them feel bigger than they actually are. They promise you great things through their ministries, but provide very little or nothing. The only people that prosper under their ministries is themselves. They exploit people for personal gain. They live sinful, fleshy lives. If you examine their character outside the pulpit, you would find that out. And eventually they are exposed. 
They don't live holy lives. They are deceptive and fool many gullible people. It's amazing how many followers these people get. They take advantage of those who are desperate for an intervention of God. This is very important because when someone is desperate for God to speak to them, they might adhere and follow these false ministers who are more than ready to give them a word. Their followers swear by them and are blindly, undiscerningly loyal. So that's how we know what false ministers are about. Solomon continues in verse 4. If the spirit of a ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. In other words, if your superior has something against you, you must remain faithful and diligent in your duties, as this will potentially solve or resolve the situation and hold no grudges against your bosses. Hold no grudges against your bosses. Verse 5, Solomon, Solomon continues, There is an evil I have seen under the sun, as an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is said in great dignity, while the rich sit in a lowly place. What that means is, is that if you have wealth, money, and power, you can get away with a lot. And guess who was a prime example of this? Yep, Solomon himself. He got away with his sin for a long time until the end of his life, in which he finally repented. So my question is, based on this passage, why does human nature attribute quality character to the rich, the famous, and the good-looking? Why does human nature attribute quality character to the rich, famous, and good-looking? Viviane, can you answer that? Uh, not quite. I'm trying to understand the question. Why do we think that rich people, famous people, and uh, and powerful people are good people as well? Are they necessarily good? No, necessarily no. Now, why is that? Why do we Why do we think they are though? Steve, I think you... it... no. Go ahead. It's just the influence because you have to examine the character to to be able to say they are good or not. Okay, Steve, what do you think? Why do we attribute good characteristics to the wit, the rich, the famous, and the wealthy? Uh, those who attribute that to the rich and the wealthy are those who are spiritually blind, who have the sin nature because they now live by sight. They don't live, uh, they don't walk in the spirit. Jesus wouldn't uh, attribute um, uh, so much to those who are rich. Actually, he rebuked some of them. Uh, the reason many people do is because um, they are spiritually dead. They don't, they are not spiritually minded. They are more fleshly minded. Okay. What about you, Jamie? Why do people attribute good characteristics to the wealthy and the famous? I think because it is the desires of the flesh. Uh -huh. to have all of those things of of this world. So because these people are rich and famous people to figure they're good people, wise they're people. Good people, they have everything, they can do anything, like it's all those fleshly sort of things and yeah. Um yeah. Well, it drives me crazy when people attribute all this intelligence to Hollywood personalities. They don't know, know they don't know any different than we do. They don't know any more than we do, but because they're famous, people want to know what they think about life. And a lot of them live very, very corrupt lives, to say the least. So I don't really want yeah, to hear And I think them. we're gonna to start to see that change, past the Lapos, which I is sure great, praise so. the Lord. It's all starting to turn around, especially for Hollywood. I hope so. I hope so. Okay, let's continue. First Samuel six seven says, But the Lord said to Samuel. Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. This was when he was trying to find a king to replace King Saul. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Well, that explains why human nature attributes quality character to the rich, the famous, and the good looking. Because man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Solomon had observed that. So here's a good question. How can we discern the heart of a man or woman and find out who's good for us and who is not? This is a tough question. So when we deal with people and when we bring people into our lives and form relationships, how can we discern who's good for us and who's not good for us? Shamar, what do you think? You judge them by their character. Well, I know that, but how? 
specifically? By how they talk, how they act, okay. how they respond, how they uh, treat other people. Okay, thank you. Oliver, what do you think? How can you tell if somebody's good for you or not? Well, um, if we can go by by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we can see if they're merciful. Ah. We, see, we can see if they're um, pure in heart. Pure in heart, kind. If they're lovers yeah. of righteousness. Peace, peacemakers, if they... Oh, okay. What about you, John? What do you think? How can you tell if someone's good for you or bad for you? Because they they will they will tell you uh, they will be honest with you, and if uh, they won't just flatter you and try to make you feel good, but if they discern that that that, that something is wrong, they will tell you that something okay. is wrong with what you're doing. Okay, so they will criticize you in spite of the fact that you might be angry at. Them. Oh, I like that. Okay, very good. Rahad, what do you say? How do you know if someone's good for you or bad for you? <laughs> That's a good one. I, I like what John said. I agree with John this time. Oh, you Every agree time. with John? Okay, well, that's one way to get out of answering. <laughs> No, uh, no, I, I just wanted, I just, I haven't answered yet. I said I agree with John because like oh, okay, so answer John, that. Go ahead. Me. That's actually, yeah, that's a very, it's a very important thing to, but also, well, if you have to see oh, what is their heart for for God. Oh, okay. You know? What's their heart for? How much it's important? Like how much <clears throat> do they love God? How much Yeshua is a priority in their life? I to see, me, I, I mean, see. that's personally. Okay, you know well, I mean? that leads me to another question. Kofi, how can you tell if someone has Jesus at the center of their lives? How can you tell? Well, Pastor, both questions. Yes. Um, we, we, can, we can answer both questions very academically. Okay, go ahead. But um, unfortunately, <laughs> these are not, um, you know, all the things that we've said are, are very nice and well, but most of the time, we don't apply what we are saying. That is true. Um, we, we miss out. It, I mean, we think it's so easy and so simple and we check this and check that, but it's very difficult to read people um, and, to, and to make right decisions. So... There are a couple of things that I use. Yes, go ahead. Number one, uh, my, my number one principle is watch and pray. Ah. So good. you have to keep your eyes open uh, and you have to pray as well um, because it is God who gives discernment. Um, and number two, time. With time, people reveal who they really are. That's true. So if we give enough time, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll be able to figure it out. Um, third one is um, the people around us that uh, are godly people and, and that we can trust. Uh -huh. Because somebody will come to you and say, hey, this person that you're hanging out with or this person that is around you, uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel right about that person. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just suspicion, but it could <clears> also be the spirit of God working through uh, through the people around us. So those are, you know, three ways in which, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, um, well, three ways that I, I typically use uh, to determine um, whether people are, are of God or not. Okay, thank you. Well, my method is watch and pray, listen to the Spirit of God, but also, am I better to have this person in my life or out of my life? If, I, if they're good for me, they'll bring me up and they'll edify me and I'll always feel better when I'm with them. Even if they tell me I'm wrong, I still will feel blessed and edified. Whereas somebody who's negative and not good for me, I don't want them in my life because they bring me down. I feel bad about them. I feel drained around them. I feel like they're stealing from me. I feel like my life is being shortened being around them. But when I'm with somebody who's good for me, it's like God has placed them in my life for a purpose. And one of those is my wife. <laughs> Mrs. Lapos gets mad at me very often and she confronts me about things, but she's good for me. She's the best person I have in my life because God gave her to me and I'm so happy to have her. And I did watch and pray to choose her because I had another choice 
on the on the other hand, it was some other girl I was interested in, but Wendy won in the end. <laughs> all right. Yes, okay, you can all applaud. Thank you. Okay, verse seven. I have seen servants on horses while princes walk on the ground like servants. What was he talking about? What Solomon was saying was that status does not guarantee character. Well, we've been talking about that for the last 10 minutes. Status does not guarantee character. Some people act big, talk big, but are very small. But some great people have great humility. In fact, in my opinion, the greater they are, the more humility they will show. That's why Jesus did not come as a rich man, as a wealthy man, as a king. Jesus came as a peasant to demonstrate to the world that even God has no regard for wealth, for fame, for good-looking people. And not only that, but Jesus was not a great-looking person because it says in Isaiah, there was nothing about him that would attract us to him. So Jesus completely shunned the standards of the world when he came to become a man. Verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits wood may be endangered by it. What is Solomon saying here? He's saying that in this life, accidents will happen. Tragedy will strike the unsuspecting, and there's a risk in life that we take every day, but we don't give much thought. So what Solomon is saying is that we must be prepared when risks bring hurt. Every day is a risk as far as, as far as Solomon is concerned. And don't forget that Solomon is still realizing the hopelessness of a life without God. So if something happens to you that you didn't expect, that's life and there is no God to help you overcome. You are at a clear disadvantage if you don't have God in your life. So is Solomon right? Are we at the disadvantage if we don't have God in our life, Steve? Yes, we are a disadvantage if we don't have God in our life. What difference does God make when something goes wrong? Why is it good to have the Lord in your life? I know it's an easy question for Christians to answer, but we don't always live it. So what's the advantage of having Jesus in your life? Because Jesus always gives us joy and peace. doesn't matter what happened outwardly. He always gives us the strength to uh, overcome everything that happens. Okay. Now, on Sunday afternoon, I preached a message where I said that Solomon was questioning whether the righteous or the unrighteous have any advantage. And he said that the same thing happens to the righteous as does to the unrighteous, that the same thing happens. We live life, we pay bills, we have a house, we raise a family, we go through trouble, the same troubles as the unbelieving. So what is the advantage of the Christian? And I gave one. We're born again by the Spirit of God. There's an advantage. Jamie, give me another advantage that the believer has. Just one. What advantage do we have? Um, I think there's many, but the most important is our salvation, that no matter what can be done to us, what can be done to the body, um, that we have everlasting life with the Lord. So that's the biggest one, I think. Okay, thank you. Rahad, what's an advantage that we have? Just one. Is that God will turn everything, everything happens to our benefit and everything that the enemy meant for evil, he will turn it for good for Wonderful. those who are called for his purposes. All things work for together for good. And call, are called for his purposes. Okay, all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Very good. Itzhak, what advantage do we have? Give me one. Mm, hope. If we know that God will never leave us in any bad situation, situation, he always give us peace, love, and everything we need. Thank so you. So we, we have hope in Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Vivian, what advantage do we have having the Lord in our life? The promises of God. If um, you have someone is sick, you know that the word of God says you can, um, we are healed. Um, okay, so the promises of God. Oliver, yeah. what advantage do we have having Jesus in our life? Well, if you're tough enough in this world, you might survive. But with Jesus, you're going to thrive. <laughs> okay. I like that. If you're tough enough, you'll survive. But if you have Jesus in your life, you will thrive. Okay, 
Amen. Kofi, what advantage does the believer have over the unrighteous? The Spirit of God. Ah, the Spirit of God. Okay, very good. So we have tremendous advantage. That's what Solomon was getting at, by the way. He figured that out towards the end of his life, but he had to go through a lot of trouble before he found out. Verse 10, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, but wisdom brings success. What was Solomon saying? He was saying something that a lot of Christians just don't understand, that if you don't prepare properly, you will end up doing more work than you bargained for. So make sure you use your head and be diligent in preparation so you don't end up wasting a lot of time making up for short-sightedness. In other words, and I use some practical examples to reinforce this thought, gas up your car before taking a long trip. Don't let garbage accumulate in your house because you'll attract rats. Kill weeds early in your garden or they will ruin your lawn. Don't delegate to incompetent people. Make sure your credit card has enough room for you to make the purchase, whatever it is. Check out things before committing. In other words, count the cost. Don't be sloppy and lazy about anything. Therefore, don't do anything for the Lord without prayer. Start your day in his presence and include Jesus in everything that you do. That's what Solomon was getting at. And how do you do that? Well, you put God first. God promises that when you put him first, you can accomplish anything you need to do. The Lord will give you grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that's from Psalms 84, verse 11. And secondly, go for the goals. Focus on goals that God leads you into. Notice I put in on the goals that God leads you into. Not your own goals, not your own fleshy desires, but the desires and the goals that God puts in your heart and give them time and thought to achieve them. Because even if something is God's will, it requires patience, diligence, preparation, and hard work. True or false? John, is that true or false? Even if true. it's God's will. True? True, true yeah. or false, Oliver? True. But we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay, Steve, true or false? Even if something is God's will, you still have to work and prepare and be diligent. It's true. <laughs> Jamie, true or false? True. Lee's true or false? It's true. Otherwise, we might miss it. <laughs> okay. We're not prepared. <laughs> Shamar, true or false? Shamar, wake up. True. True. Rahad, true or false? True. Okay. And why is and Vivian, true or false? It's true. There is God part and human part. Our part. I'm so glad somebody said that. Thank you so much. I could give you a hug. Yes. <laughs> in everything that God wills for us, we have a part to play. Even getting somebody saved, we have a part to play. It's true that only the Father can draw people to Jesus. But unless we preach to them, they'll never come to Jesus. Unless we pray for them, the veil that Satan sets up in front of their hearts and their minds will never be torn away. So we have a part to play in the unfolding plan of God. Thank you, Vivian, for mentioning that. I'm so happy you said it. Move on. Here we go. A serpent may bite when it is not charmed, but the babbler is no different. That means that people will hurt you when you least expect it, so be ready for it. And then Solomon gets into the fool. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. The words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is raving madness. A fool also multiplies words. No man knows what is to be and who can tell what will be after him. So my question is, <laughs> how can you tell the difference between a fool and a wise man? Lees. Knew you were coming to me because a <laughs> fool is generally walking in the opposite direction where the word of God leads us. Oh, okay. Steve, how can you tell the difference between a fool and a wise man? The Bible says the fool say in his heart there is no God. Woo! Oh, man. And, uh, the Bible says also that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay. Jamie, how can you tell the difference between a fool and a wise man? I would say uh, fools ignore advice because they are wise in their own eyes. Oh, okay. That's good. That's true. Solomon said that. Rahad, how can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool? That's important. Honestly, 
That's that's a very good good question for yeah, me. Especially it's when like you're looking for husbands. <laughs> now Solomon was saying that you can tell the difference by the way they walk. By the way they walk, okay. Well, okay, how they yeah. live their life. Yeah, Inside. that's right. How can you tell the difference between a fool and a wise man? Hey, I think fool man always always in search of earthly th earthly things and uh, and a wise man always in search of heavenly things. Oh, okay. So the fool searches for earthly things and the wise man searches for heavenly things. John, how can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool? Okay, and what you just read, it's said in different words that he's long-winded oh long-winded yes it's true he is long-winded <laughs> it's he likes what you just read before it's in there the pa yeah the passage outlines exactly what a fool is like okay vivian how can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool sorry how can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool? Turn on your microphone, Vivian. Yeah, sorry. I mean, uh, the the Bible said the fool says in his heart there is no God. Oh, so okay. a person who denies God is fool, a fool. Okay, so someone who denies God is a fool. So don't marry anybody who doesn't love God. Shamar, how can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool? A fool uh, talks a lot and uh, puts on a big uh, presentation, but a wise man is humble and quiet. Reserved. Oh, okay. okay. That's a good criteria. It doesn't always apply, but it's a good criteria. And what about you, Kofi? How can you tell the difference between a wise man and a fool? Again, it's not a science. It's an, it's an art, really. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe a, a, a fool lives for today only. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the wise man lives uh, for uh, the the future and eternity. The, yeah, the okay. Eternal future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. A fool lives for today, thinking he'll never yeah. die. He's going to live forever in this miserable, cursed earth. And a wise man lives for eternity and thinks about his death, prepares for his death. I like that. Very good answers, everybody. Arrogance, arrogance too. I feel like it's <laughs> arrogance. Yeah. Okay. Well, here, I wise men. I put down what I thought. Wise men fear God. Wise men quote and live by the word of God. Wise men don't talk a lot, but when they do, their, their advice is gold. Wise men don't pontificate about your life, and they don't make unfounded speculations, like the Lord told me you should marry this guy. Give me a break. Fools like to hear themselves talk. They don't listen. The more they talk, the more nonsense they spew. Fools speak for God presumptuously. I believe that with all my heart. In short, you can tell the difference in the way that they speak. Now, Solomon did a lot of talking, writing, and teaching in his life, but he ended up a fool because he did not follow his own advice. If you read the book of Proverbs, you'll see that a lot of the things that Solomon says were foolish, he did. So the fool that he so often refers to in his writings is himself. And that must have been a very bitter pill for poor old Solomon to swallow. Then he moves on in verse 15, and he says, The labor of fools wearies them for they do not even know how to go to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. So again, it seems to me here, Solomon is gleaning from his own life experience. When he started out, he felt like a child, which drove him to God because he felt inadequate to govern God's people. But then as he became older, he became reckless and he became a child in his foolishness. He did stupid things. Yet every time he sought the Lord, he was noble. He was a noble king and he governed wisely and used his gifts not only to indulge himself, but to honor God and to serve his people. So Solomon's talking about himself in these passages here, in this verse. Hmm. Verse 18, because of laziness, the building decays. And through idleness of hands, the, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. If you have money, Solomon says, you can cover for your mistakes by paying your way out of them. Just throw a party, as Solomon did many times. But if you don't have money, woe is you. In other words, Solomon believed that money doesn't solve all problems, but it will surely solve all of mine. 
Well, he uh, found out in his life that money solves nothing with regard to salvation and status with God. But this reinforces my thought that I've preached many times, that money is the lifeblood of the world, as the spirit is the lifeblood of the kingdom. But the spirit can influence our money, whereas money cannot influence the spirit. And if that's the case, why do we have so many ministers claiming that if we give to their ministries, we'll receive a miracle? Anyway, that's another issue for another time. So my question is, how can we bring the Spirit of God into our financial situation? How can we bring the Spirit of God into our financial situation? Jamie. Well, first and foremost, I would say tithing. I think that's huge. You know, we can never outgive God. So I think by you know, humbling ourselves and tithing back to him. We're blessed right there. Um, and I've done that my whole life since I was 15 and I started working and, you know, that's really showed. Um, so I'm a huge believer of tithing. Number one. Um, I think number two for me, the, you know, part of my daily prayer is thanking the Lord for providing all of the provisions that he provides in my life every day, whether it be in spiritually, psychologically, physically, financially. So just giving him that knowledge and, you know, giving him all the glory for that because he is the provider. Okay. Thank you. Do you believe that the spirit has control over our money, John? Yes. You do? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, so do I. It says, it says in scriptures to give and it shall be given unto you. That's right. Press, Press down, down, shake it together and running over. over Shall yeah. men give unto you? Uh, okay, great. Oliver, do you believe that the spirit has influence over our money? Of course. I think so, definitely, sir, uh, Pastor Alex, because um, if we have control of our money and the Holy Spirit is in us, so the spirit has control of our, us and the money. Okay, so I'm going to ask Steve a very difficult question. Steve, how does tithing affect the human heart to believe that God will supply all our needs? How does tithing affect us spiritually? I think tithing is so important, as Jamie just explained, because it is the heart of gratitude. Uh, whenever we tithe, whenever we receive something from God, and we prioritize him, we give him the, the one-tenth, yeah. Whatever he blesses us, That's Abraham right. did it, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob did it. This is actually our proof that we love him. Uh, when he gives us everything, and we thank him by giving him what belongs to him. Uh, That's uh, an act of worship to tell him that uh, we are grateful for what he has given us. And uh, we also believe that he's going to give us more. It's an act of faith also. It's an act of faith, an act of worship. Okay. An act of trust, an act of gratitude. Yeah. Jamie, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Do you have testimonies in your life where the 90% that God remained or that remained in your lap after you tied went further than if you have kept 100%? Would the Did the 90% that you had after you tied go further than if you had kept 100% of your money? <laughs> absolutely and then See? some um i'd like to share a quick testimony if yeah, I can go ahead. quickly um there was a time you know when my mom passed from covid a few years ago um about two months after that i really my body became under physical attack from it and i was very sick for about a year and a half and just going to many doctors and many co-payments and just just a, a rabbit hole of a run and just a lot of money exerted out and um about a year after that, so this is, you know, probably just like maybe six months ago, I come home one day and there's a stack on my table and it's probably about 25 to 30. It looks like pay stubs. So I thought it was my husband's. And I'm like, what do you have so many pay stubs for? Like, would you keep them in your car? And he said, that's, that's not for me. That's for you. And what? I said, for me, what is it? He said, Jamie, it's checks. And I said, checks. Oh. And I went and looked at it and it was the Lord. Only God could do this. Every single copay I had to pay for that year and a half was reimbursed to me on a stack on the table. I couldn't even believe it. I was like, 
only God could do something like that. Cause what kind of medical company would give me back every single copay? That's it incredible. just made no sense whatsoever. So it's just like little things like that. I have so many different testimonies, but that was the biggest one that I was just like, wow, to see them all at once, like all that money that the enemy just depleted from me and with my health and with the sickness. And the Lord was just like, no, he healed me. He provided it back to me. And then some, and then that was able to be poured back into the ministry. Like you said, we, I do many things you know, so praise God for that. That's just one of many. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. What yeah. a testimony. That's great. Wonderful. Verse 20, do not curse the king, even if your thought, even in your thought, do not curse the rich, even in your bedroom, for a bird of the air may carry your voice and a bird in flight may tell the matter. In other words, watch your tongue because you never know who could be listening or pass on what you say to others. Be careful of gossip in particular. So the general theme of chapter 10, as we come to a close, is that Solomon is exposing in chapter 10 fools, of which he was one of the big ones. And our great advantage of believers is that we are protected from being foolish. So my last question is, where do we gain wisdom and how can we build it up? Kofi, I'm going to give that one to you. Where can we find build, uh, wisdom and how can we practically build up wisdom? Uh, I believe there's... Uh... Scripture that says that he who lacks wisdom should ask God. Okay. Uh, and God will give, um, who gives liberally will give him wisdom. So, yeah, James uh, I chapter that's one. That's the first, yeah, that's the first, uh, that's a starting point. Um, wisdom comes from God. Um, come over building okay. wisdom, building, you know, um, uh, I guess developing that or cultivating that. Okay. Um, is uh, the the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that you know, cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit um, uh, allows the Holy Spirit to apply that wisdom um, in our lives uh, to fulfill the purpose uh, for it. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Us. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What about you, Steve? How can we gain wisdom from God? How can we build it up from day to day and from situation to situation? The Bible says that Christ is made unto us wisdom, that of him, a wing Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Uh, I really believe that uh, uh, the more we know Christ Jesus, uh, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ will increase the grace and peace in our life. He also says uh, in 2 Corinthians, that grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. I believe that grace is wisdom. As we increase in grace, we increase in wisdom. Amen. He also, That's what, no, he, also says, he also says that according as his divine power had given unto us, all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So it is through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus that we come to enjoy the blessings and walk in the wisdom that he has already provided for us. Thank you so much. And so chapter 10 has told us, don't be foolish, be wise by giving everything to the Lord and adhering and staying close to him. Thank you so much for listening. Our Bible study has come to an end. Thanks, Jamie, for joining us this week. Hope to see you soon again. Kofi, would you close in prayer, please? Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful to you, um, and we thank you. Um, we, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for the lessons that we are receiving from the Word of God and from this book, Ecclesiastes. We thank you for... Um, what you've placed in Pastor's heart uh, to share in this season of God. I just pray for each and every one of us. You know where, wherever we are, um, what we are going through, what we need to come out on the other side. Um, you know what we lack, oh God. And we know that you are our source. And so we come to you tonight, Father, just asking um, that you will grant us the wisdom um, you will build in us that knowledge that uh, Steve was just talking about, Lord, that we will grow in that knowledge. And we, will do, we will grow 
um, in our walk with you, O oh God, and that you um, pour out your spirit into us to remind us of the words of Christ, to teach us all truth, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will give us solutions to uh, the, the hardships and the issues that we go through, uh, that you will make a way, even as uh, Jamie shared her testimony, that you will make a way for us, O oh God, uh, where there seems to be no way. We ask, Father, for tangible miracles in our lives that we can testify of in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you and we give you praise. And we pray a blessing over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Now, next week, we'll be doing chapter 11. And then the week after that, Kofi is going to review chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. So we're almost done, but we've learned a lot from this book and thank God for it. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye. God bless you, everybody.